Welcome back to the Pursuit Podcast. I'm your host, Jessica Rose. This week, we're going to be having a conversation about design, be it you working as a designer, you working with designers, or what the future of design might look like. I'm here today with... Scott Riley. I'm a designer and an author. An author. So what have you written? Oh, that sounds like a challenge. (laughs) What have you done with your life? Oh, so you're an author. Yeah, I can say that now because I'm published and I want everyone to know because... I have that level of deep set arrogance. Is it a bit like getting your PhD where you're like, oh, everybody's got to call me doctor for the first three weeks? I assume so. Yeah. 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 It's kind of like the high of I've spent the last 12 months in a self-serving cycle of hell writing this thing. So give me the next two to just constantly remind you that I did it. Thanks very much. Fantastic. So you claim to have written a book. Come on, what's it called? So we can all look it up and marvel over it. Uh, It's called Mindful Design. And it was released super late last year. So when you talk about mindful design, I think this might be a really good place to jump in and start talking about design. Mm -hmm. Do you mean sort of mindfulness and meditation and the stuff that was all very, very hip late 2016? Um, No, although that's kind of where a lot of the basis for like my thinking around design has come from is bringing some of the insights from that into our practice but this is more about understanding the mind in general understanding a lot of the systems of the mind and and how we can use that to be a little bit more compassionate a little bit more cognizant of the struggles that people might face instead of seeing the mind which i think design does and has done for a while now seeing it as an obstacle or a series of obstacles to overcome so it's about flipping that discussion a little bit and exploring how the mind works as the mind works And there's two ways we can approach it. We can see it as inspirational and we can see it as something that informs our work, or we can see it as a challenge and we can see it as obstacles to overcome and essentially just try and get the conversation away from design being digital tricksters into actually kind of understanding and appreciating the way the mind works. So I love that framing for the way design might often work, that we're We're aware of the mind. We're aware of the way people think and process and use things. But it's almost a combative, like, well, people are going to try and do this. Let's make sure they can't. Yeah, yeah. So I want to, let's begin in the beginning. Uh, And I'd like to sort of approach this in a way that might be really useful for somebody who's really interested in design and really interested in getting into design. How did you get started? And if the way you got started isn't some way you'd recommend, how would you recommend folks start engaging with like sort of the design community and learning about design these days? The way I got started was, well, initially I wanted to be a games designer and then I went to university to follow that dream. And then I realized actually what was involved with games design and what was involved with trying to work in the games industry and, and swiftly left. So you decided not to go into games? No, no. I think, um, uh, and this is a danger with design and tech as well, I think, too. But I had kind of romanticized it to the point where I was never going to live up to my expectations. I've kind of just used the skills that really basic programming skills I picked up trying to make games and just started taking on some like really low pay and really um, entry level web development jobs. And then I got really sick of everything I made looking terrible. So I started kind of self-teaching design and... How charming is it that it's it's the, your own horror about your early work that, that drove you... Hmm, drove you to sounds very much like you were pushed screaming into being aware of design and competent. Yeah. Encouraged towards, shall we? <laughs> yeah. What ways do you think might be really useful for folks interested in design now? Or what resources out there might be really, really helpful for folks beginning these days? I think it, it depends on how much you know about design as a starting point, or really how much you know about the tech industry and how exposed you are to design processes. Like if you're a developer who wants to get into design, you know, you have resources readily available to you with any designers you work with in terms of just watching their process and, and understanding the deliverables and deadlines and however that might be structured. Skillshare is decent. Cat Small has done a really amazing kind of intro to UX and strategic design up on Skillshare, which is really worth checking out. The lessons are really short, but those kind of short lessons where you just learn something like every millisecond, right? Yeah. That's a really good one to pick up on. I think super high are great if you want a a longer term, more involved, course-driven approach to learning. And I do think that certain courses as well, traditional courses are getting better. 
Oh. There's an interaction design course in Belfast, which Chris Murphy was running. That's really good. And I think, you know, I got into this like 10 years ago. And there really was not that much in terms of formal study available to people. So I think that's changing. And I know a lot of people are like, you don't need formal study and you don't need degrees to get into design and all that stuff, which is true. But I do still think if you are young and the opportunity is there and you're, you're privileged enough to have access to further and higher education, then it's absolutely worth pursuing if you think that's going to motivate you. So, yeah, I I think there's a lot of discussion, not just in design, but across development, even project management, on whether or not people need degrees. And for longtime listeners of the podcast, we did go ahead and feature a lot of people in tech who've done a lot of great things without degrees. My general rule for giving unsolicited advice is letting folks know that if it is accessible and wouldn't damage their lives to get a degree... Sometimes just having the administrative process, just being able to get visas, just being able to network with peers who are in the same space can be useful even before you count in the instruction. Yeah, yeah. And I think as well, like what that kind of formal structure gives you, what I think design is lacking still now is that kind of traditional approach to academia as well. And the idea of how to conduct a proper study you know, the amount of startups that exist these days that essentially just every study they produce is like an exercise in ruining data <laughs> because they don't have anyone there who has been through that academic process of how to conduct a study, how to... And this is more important with the research and I guess feeding into user testing towards the end. But the amount of people who just, because everyone on the team is this kind of a self-taught, self-made practitioner, there's a lot that you can learn in terms of, of how academia can fit in with design and You know, it took me a hell of a long time to learn that because I didn't do academia. (laughs) And when I did, I was really terrible at it, so. It it sounds as well like the confidence you get from learning these things in an academic process can be important. So being able to say, oh, wow, not only do am I able to do, because a lot of really fantastic self-taught folks are able to do beautiful studies, but saying, oh, wow, I've got the confidence to know what I think correctness in the space looks like, or, whew, My professor went over this and I think this is how we do it. Yeah. And then there's all the intangibles as well, like a relatively pressure free in terms of that you won't be messing anyone's income or profits or how they might appease venture capitalists up if you make mistakes, right? Like you're there to make mistakes. You have the structure of hitting deadlines and hitting mid-project deadlines and producing all this material that, okay, maybe only 60% of it translates to the real world fast-paced startup or industry kind of darling approach to design and tech but you're still there you're able to make mistakes and I think even with kind of you hire a junior developer or junior designer now there's still pressure on them to deliver I think like unjust pressure in a lot of places as well to to deliver so for those usually at the end of these conversations I make sure to signpost like oh hey here's where you can find Scott on social media here's where you can find more conversations and more material, and of course the book. I'm going to go ahead and do that plug here in the middle, because for those of you who may know Scott, for him to talk about the way we work with early stage designers, and for him to talk about venture capital without swearing, this is very beautiful and strange. If you want the full sweary experience, Scott, where do you live on social media? Just Twitter, uh, Scott underscore Riley. So Scott is going to be putting all the swears that he's left out of this interview up online, I imagine, fairly promptly. Yep. So Scott, let's come around and talk a little bit about the book and some sort of some sort of takeaways that you could give maybe our our dear listener who's working in design or a dear listener who's really, really passionate about design, but doesn't do it as a profession. So you talk about mindful design as taking in taking into account the way we the way we think the way we interact with things and the things we need from digital products and i think on a very fundamental level that's such i say interesting too much but it's such a very very compelling sort of road to go down as you explore could you talk a little bit about if we made you king of the design world tomorrow what edict would you like to lay down what would you like to tell us all to do or ask us all to do to make design, in your mind, a little bit better? I think that would be the strangest coronation in the history of life. But I think for me, uh, something that it almost took right in this book for me to really be able to put this into words, but I think the biggest thing for me is that 
design should democratize. And by democratize, I mean it should provide access to systems for people who didn't previously have that access or were previously purposefully pushed away or had those systems obfuscated too much for them to affect change within them. So by that, I mean design is all about simplifying things. And we're actually really good at it. Like most designers and, and most people in tech are really good at making stuff simple, right? Like the entire point of tech's current role in convenience as a service is about making it easier to get overpriced food on the table or make it easier to get someone to come and pick your laundry up or make it easy to do everything that white Californian men's parents did for them before they moved to San Francisco for a job. I think for me, the point I'm trying to make with the book is that we're already good at simplifying things. We're already good at abstracting things out, even automating certain things. And the responsibility comes from who we simplify for. That's very interesting. So taking sort of the processes we see in in sort of early stage startups, in these, these ideas that get pinged around, oh, I want somebody to do my laundry. Oh, I want somebody to come make me a sandwich. Mm -hmm. But really applying them to access for the things we're already building and the way we're already doing things. Sort of task rabbit for clear understanding and better access of existing projects instead of paying someone a fiver to put up a table. Yeah, yeah. But I think as well, like question the systems that we're working on top of, right? I see the more I work in design and the more I think about design's role in the world. And this is specifically interaction design and UX design where I'm coming from with this. So it probably doesn't relate back to many other forms of design. But the way I see it is the longer I've spent designing and thinking about design, the more I've seen it as something that's just based around systems. And that could be anything from the system of an existing product all the way through to the systems of political control, financial systems, financial institutes, taking control of your own finances, systems of political upheaval, the prison system, poverty, all that stuff. If you see that as a system and you see design's job is to simplify systems, it's a question of, are we approaching stuff the right way? Are we thinking about the right things to make easier? And I don't think we are. So you mentioned two different terms, and for those of our listeners who may not know them, or for, for those who may think they know them and want to have sort of a, another look at them, what is interaction design? What is UX? And for bonus points, have a polite argument with yourself or with me about the difference between UX and UI and how everybody uses them wrong. The only thing I know very, very completely about designers is they love to argue about that. Oh, yeah, we do. Um, so interaction design is essentially, it's really hard to put into a su succinct phrase when you've just written an entire book about it. Were you about is, to say it's about designing interactions? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. No, so interaction design is essentially about designing the transitions between different states, really. If you think of specific interface, say Instagram, for example, its default state is the timeline full of people's photos people's food yeah people's food people's holidays you're on instagram you're on this the timeline when you're talking about designing interactions it's going to be moving away from the timeline or moving into different actions you could take yeah yeah the first step to interaction design is to communicate action possibility which is a fancy way of saying make sure your buttons look like buttons and your icons communicate <laughs> that's very beautiful and very sort of I'm from the States a long time ago, so it feels like a very Southern California take, like, oh, yeah, communicate yeah, all oh, the possibilities that exist for you. Yeah, yeah. But it's, it's an important thing to consider, to be fair, is I think a lot of people get caught up in smaller interactions or they get caught up in, you know, actually designing that transition before they think about kind of what actions is actually possible and how do we communicate that. You know, to me, that's the that's the bedrock of your design. So it sounds like if you were to leave someone with one small piece, like one takeaway of incredibly practical information, it's, hey, hey you, make sure your buttons look like buttons. Yeah, I think that's that's the, the be all and end all of design really is, is you know, <laughs> forget responsibilities, forget ethics, forget injecting the world with fun and humor and all that exciting stuff. Just, just make buttons look like buttons. You know we're going to edit this down so it's just you saying, forget about ethics, forget about humor. <laughs> Everything's fine. <laughs> so make sure your buttons look like buttons, please and thank you. Yep. Once you're reliably doing that, also the the ethics and the humor. 
Uh, So I think ethics is really interesting. We talk a lot in the industry right now, and hopefully even more in the future, about the ethics of algorithm design, the ethics of machine learning, and the ethics of some types of development. Mm -hmm. I'm really interested in sort of the one-on-one, very a very broad look at what kind of ethical concerns do designers hold and what kind of ethical concerns should designers move out through the world? What would you like? Like what kind of ethical concerns, what kind of ethical questions, ethical quandaries would you like designers to sit awake at night with? Oh, so many. I think the one of the biggest things for me is, again, going back to the idea of whose life are you making easier? I think if you are building something that makes middle class white people's lives slightly more convenient, and that's where you're putting your time, I don't see that as like a net positive thing. I think anything that allows the status quo to proliferate is digital propaganda. I think that if you are actively making the lives of people just like you easier or you know people at the top of the food chain of power structure if you're making their lives easier that's a actually a net negative and I would really reconsider my entire career if I found myself in that position I think the ethics of um, if you're making uber for mustache wax it might be time to to stop and think about what you're doing yeah yeah I mean they're the easy problems the, the stuff that just makes people's lives a little bit more convenient and kind of this middle ground of tech right now where they're highly marketable to people who have money. There's an insidious kind of feeling about that in like almost every tech discussion is based around vanity metrics. People get hired because they're good at improving conversion rates or they're good at monetizing free user accounts into premium user accounts and growth hacking is a thing that exists. And I think just somewhere down the line is this push to abstracted, untempered, late-stage capitalism, where it's like, this metric means this money, so this is what we push for. And then there's a lot to unwrap within that as well. So I think with discussions on what people work on, what people are choosing to work on, um, I'm always really careful to point to, not everyone has a ton of options on this. So, Oh, um, no, no. You or I, I hear that you're an author. (laughs) You and I, like, can I say we're old? We're, 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 we're getting, yeah. we're getting there. We're, we're grown. And we live, we're both living in the UK, which for at least the next couple of weeks is going to continue to have a robust economy. Yep. Up to several weeks more of this. Um, so for us to say, oh, wow, you can choose what you work on is very, very true. But keeping in mind that that's not always true, that if you're very junior in your career or you're working someplace that doesn't have a really robust tech scene with the kinds of local salaries that people talk about when they talk about the choice that exists in London or San Francisco. Mm-hmm. That yeah, the ability to make these choices really depends on where you are and where you are in your career. Yeah. But if you do have these options, wow, you've got some fantastic opportunities to make beautiful, useful choices and like build cool, weird stuff. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's it would be remiss to talk about that without talking about the privilege that lies in or the, the privilege that underpins that choice. There's a whole like kind of systemic chain of privilege that allows me to sit here or stand here and say, you can just choose not to work on awful products. Great. Uh, and I know that's not real life. And I know that personally, sometimes I have to work on stuff that doesn't light a fire in my belly. And I'm the one standing here saying, you should only work on, you know, this is all aspirational, right? It's stuff that if... I love how you stop just short of, of talking smack about a specific client. You're like, hypothetically, I might... Yep. (laughs) But no, this is all aspirational. This is all kind of, I'm a cynical human, but at the core, especially with design, I'm quite hopeful and optimistic. And I think that oftentimes it's it's easy to get carried away with that and, and not to stop and check the cacophony of privileges that allow me to be in this position. So... So we'd like to gently push people to, like, if you've got the options, if you've, yeah, if you have the ability to, the privilege of getting to decide what you work on, work on things that bring you genuine joy, work on beautiful, useful things that you're proud of, if you can. Yeah, yeah. And I think as well, there comes a certain point, and especially if if your goal is to kind of get into like leadership and management position as well. I think the more you progress with your career in design, the more, at least for me anyway, the more I've kind of really started to to learn and, 
you know, worry about the implications of decisions in the early stages of design. And I think there's a lot of ethical stuff just in that kind of changes to process as well that I think should exist that can really only be implemented from a position of leadership. So yeah, it's 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 one of those things where, you know, when you're first getting started in the industry or you know, if you don't have access to the roles and the choices that a lot of people have later in their career or with a bigger network or having to live in a tech hub, you know, it is, it is something that is more aspirational. It's something to strive for later on in your career. If you're not fancy now, you might be fancy later. And then, then you'll show them all. Exactly. Yeah. We've talked a lot, perhaps that speaks directly to our dear listener who might be looking to get into design or work with design for the first time. I want to address sort of the needs of a different audience, which is what if you've been in design for a while? What if you've been doing work like this for a while? And wow, are you disillusioned? You are tired of everything. You are swearing on social media nonstop. You just want to burn it all down. <laughs> um, how do you either move past that or work with that to continue? How do you not flame out? How do you stay in an industry that's often really, really challenging with challenging deadlines, with a lot of sort of really, really high impact demands on your time, uh, where you're not always able to choose what you work on? This is interesting for me because welcome to the club. This is kind of the position I'm in now. And it's the, you know, one of the questions that's been on my mind for quite a while. I don't know. I see myself as a small voice of dissent in design. And I think there's a lot of people who challenge design a lot more eloquently than me. But I think there's a place for dissent and debate and challenging questions in design. And if you're bored or disaffected or angry at the, the status quo, I think start thinking about how you can use your skills as a designer to affect change in that. So you're suggesting that when you are tired of all of it and everybody gets tired of anything eventually, that you'd like our dear listener or you'd like anyone out there to sort of take a look at where you can make a difference doing what you're doing, but also maybe write a book if you need a break. Don't, don't write a book if you need a break. Do never, never write. I hear that's really relaxing. Yeah, it is. It's super relaxing. It's the sauna and spa of surviving. It takes uh, three, four weeks, maybe, maybe six. Uh, I reckon a few changes to process. You could probably do it in two. <laughs> we are absolutely kidding. It does look to be several months to several years of a weirdly specific hellscape. Yeah, it was probably ten months flat out of my time. It was my full time job last year. And it was extremely mentally draining and it was extremely difficult. And there was a lot of times where I just wanted to just be like, no, suck this. I'm never writing a book again. I'm going to France for a month. Leave me alone. And then I just went to France and carried on with the book. But the temptation to, to just drop it and go back to freelance and stuff was, was very difficult to ignore a lot of times. It's a, it's a difficult undertaking. Okay. So, so far we've got, don't stay in design long enough to get terribly jaded. Never write a book. Don't bother taking a vacation in France. You're just going to waste it. Um, <laughs> do we have any of the demotivation? Don't be me. <laughs> Listen to this podcast about what you shouldn't become. It's great. We've got a, an object lesson in not being Scott. <laughs> That's my legacy. <laughs> it's like, just don't. The legacy. Yeah. I want to talk briefly about maybe our dear listener who isn't a designer, but works closely with designers. Maybe you're a developer, maybe you're an architect, maybe you're a manager. What kinds of things do you wish that non-design stakeholders really knew about design? By which I mean, what do you want folks to stop doing? I think it's less about what stop doing and what people should start doing. And I think oh. that's kind of challenging design from a fundamental humanistic approach so learn a lot of these underpinnings that it's first buy my book because it's full of that kind of information <laughs> what was your book called again it's called mindful design it's a big green thing it's really thick it's great it's hard to read in bed but you're... there's no swearing <laughs> there is no swearing in it the closest to swearing is bs the acronym bs <laughs> there used to be swearing in it but we added to the out. <laughs> I, I imagine that folks can have you send a signed copy that has the swearing sort of put back in pen in the margins. Yeah, yeah, I could do that. Director's cut. Why not? <laughs> Just write another book. <laughs> Just a little pamphlet with all the swears that got left out. 
Yeah, yeah. Just tucked into the side. That'd be great. But no, I think um, people give bad feedback because they don't understand what went into a process. And first and foremost, that's on whoever's leading design throughout that process to get people on board early and asking the right questions at the right time. It's very easy to give feedback on finished prototypes that set designs back weeks, maybe even months, just because you weren't involved early on or you didn't understand the process early on. And I think for me, what people should start doing is challenging the any baked in assumptions that arise. You know, if you're designing a feature and you're at the early stage, kind of prototyping, wireframing, scribbling stage, there should be people there from all different backgrounds, all different walks of life, all different experience levels to question some of the BS, question some of the biases, <laughs> the assumptions that are worked in. Because without that, then you're just building something for yourself. Or you're just building something with bias and assumption baked in from the start. And I think a lot of teamwork and what I valued the most from the really good teams I've worked with and the really good colleagues I've worked with has been assumption challenging because I've gone off and tried to design around something that I think is a problem. And someone's had to say to me, chill out, explore the problem space. You aren't just designing for yourself. So I think the more people who who can bring that experience in and intuitively just say, this is a bit one-eyed, this is a bit one-dimensional, take a step back at the right time. That's what I value most in, especially product people. If I work with a product person who prompts me to do something like that, that's when I know it's going to be a good project because I think that's what designers need. It's what CEOs need as well, to be fair, just that little (laughs) kind of purposeful pessimism to say, think about how this could fail, think about who it would affect if it fails, and think about who it serves if it succeeds. And anyone can ask those questions, anyone. All you need is decent research and to not be a terrible human. (laughs) Fantastic advice and a gentle prod towards our our sort of continued humanity. Scott, thank you so much for joining us. If folks did want to find you online, where do you live on the internet? Uh, You can go to scott.is, which is my personal website, um, the scott.is. And you can find me on Twitter at scott underscore Riley. And if folks absolutely needed that extremely good book, it was called Mindful Design, wasn't it? It was. You can grab that at mindfuldesign.xyz because all the good domains were taken. (laughs) Scott, thank you so much for your time. No worries. It was a pleasure. And thank you, dear listener, for joining us for the Pursuit Podcast. If you're right back next Tuesday, we'll be back too. We look forward to you joining us then. 